Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Um, we're here with Carl. He's back from hospital. He's in a lot of pain. He's got a great big scar across his belly there. He, he had to have his hernia taken out. So that's pretty, pretty strict thing to have done. And, uh, he's in a lot of pain. So we're really pleased that he's here today with us. And we just pray that they can get the medication to him. So. So I'm going to ask Kyle to open in prayer, if he can. Dear Heavenly Father, it's so nice to be here again, this nice sunny morning. I ask in thy name that you bless all our brothers and sisters, that you make their day go well, peaceful and happy. I say this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And we wish all the best to Kyle, that things will get better quickly so here yeah, is some um, sabbath day today a beautiful day here in in clay cross and uh i think last night people will went out and look at the aurora but i missed it because i stayed I in that, yeah. and it some people who live in the local area have got pictures of the aurora but you know purples and green maybe if we go out tonight maybe we can see that again so you normally can't see that until up northern ways and stuff. So. You're in the Norfolk Road, see it. Yeah. So people from Medway saw it. People from Clay Cross saw it. People from Scotland saw it even better. So, yeah, hope you, hopefully you've got your emblems ready. And uh, so that's the wine and the bread. And uh, would, I'm just about, or did you want to bless the bread? You can bless the bread if you like. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ, as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. So, Carl, you stay where you are. If you can, kneel or bow as we read the blessing on the bread. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. And as we prepare to take the wine, may I once again ask you to bow or kneel, whatever is okay with you. And Kyle will offer the prayer for the wine. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this water to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen.
this week's topic is based off of John three sixteen and 17. John three sixteen is a very famous scripture in the country that I live in. People put it up at sporting events and, you know, just all over the place. You see it all over the place. It's on t-shirts. But I feel like verse 17 gets ignored. And there's a really, really important part in there. It's wonderful. I love the fact that God sent his only begotten son so that we would not perish. But I love even more that he was sent not to condemn the world. Satan is here to condemn us. That's why he's the accuser. Satan means accuser. He wants us to feel like we're not good enough. Jesus came for everyone but us. And I can tell you, growing up in the particular church that I did, I never felt like I was good enough. Every little thing I did wrong, I just felt like, you know, there was this idea that there were levels of sin. And I was always like, where am I at on the sin chart? Am I good enough? Am I good enough? Am I good enough? But every time I prayed, the Lord told me, yeah, you're good enough. You're good. You're good. But I just couldn't believe the Lord because of everything that I was hearing growing up in that particular church. And it's not unique to the, that particular church. A lot of the kids that I grew up with didn't belong. In fact, all, none of them belonged to that particular church. The overwhelming majority of them were Protestants. And those that went to church regularly, none of them felt like they were good enough. I remember overhearing this girl crying to another girl at school one time, talking about how, you know, she hates going to church because she, she knows God doesn't love her. Imagine going to church and feeling like God doesn't love you. That's the exact opposite point of church. Jesus said that he came that, that the physician comes for the sick, not the whole. Implying that he came for the sick, not the whole. And I can tell you that that didn't just happen in school. I heard it in, in various youth activities from various people. But it's important that you understand that God sent his son for everyone, including you. He didn't sit in here to condemn you or anybody else. And so there's two parts to this message. The first is we've got to stop condemning ourselves. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. Beloved children, as a parent, I understand that in a way that I couldn't understand before, before I had kids. Just this morning, I got up to discover that my youngest child pulled a cucumber out of the fridge for breakfast. Not really a big deal. And he peeled the skin off so that he could eat it. Again, not a big deal. He peeled it all over the floor instead of over the sink. And I discovered it when I groggily got up and slipped on the peels. A little more frustrating. He is not so tiny that he could not have gotten a chair or a stool and done it correctly. He missed the mark. So did I, did I grab him? Did I spank him? Did I wail on him? No. I asked him to get a broom. I asked him to sweep it up and put it in a trash can. I always tell my kids... It doesn't bother me that you make a mess. It's just important that when you do, you clean up after yourself. It doesn't bother me when you spill milk. It's just that when you do, you need to clean it up. These scriptures here, looking at it from a parent's eyes, Jesus came to ensure that we can all have eternal life. God says, it doesn't bother me that you miss the mark. The question is, are we going to clean it up? There's no work that we can do to clean it up. There are certain sins that cannot be taken back. Sometimes because they emotionally hurt someone and they have to work through the pain that, that we cause. And we have to work through the guilt of acknowledging that we caused that pain. And the atonement is there to heal both parties. Because Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to say, Teshua, let's get back on track. You missed the mark? Let's, let's, let's reel it back in. I like the story of the iron rod, or I believe in Joseph Smith Sr.'s dream, it was a, a rope. Because there's an idea that there's this path, this middle line that could straight to that tree, where you can partake of the fruit and the reality is that sometimes we veer off to 
the one side. And then we go to try to correct. We veer off to the other side. And then we go to correct. But through the atonement of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter that we're going over here. Because he is centering us. He is like the magnet that causes the compass to point north. We're always, in, as we veer off course, he's like, hey, I'm over here. And he protects us and still guides us to the tree. Unless we just say, okay, forget about it. I'm throwing this all down. I'm going to the great and spacious building. And even then, even then, his hand is extended saying, I'm here. Come back. So we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to think that we aren't good enough. There's never a point when AA gives up on an alcoholic. When they fall prey to their alcoholism, they're always there to welcome them back. And that, to me, is one of the reasons why I see that particular organization as an amazing view into Christianity. Because alcoholism is a literal demon. Now, when I say literal demon, I don't mean that it's necessarily people are possessed by demons, but the disease itself is something that is hard to control. It is something that people wrestle with and fight. Now, I can empathize with that, but I can't understand it because I am not addicted to alcohol. I don't really drink. But at the same time, I am not a perfect person. We all have our own little vices. And what AA asks is, are you willing to keep trying? And the Lord asks the same thing. I'm going to share a story with you guys. When I was in middle school, I had a paper out. And I would, you know, go and deliver papers. And then once a month, I would go and collect the money. And every day, I walked past this car shop, mechanic shop that was closed. And every day I would look at that pop machine, soda pop machine, and I wanted to get one. But we, I was raised to believe that drinking anything with caffeine, so Coke, Mountain Dew, Dr. Pepper, etc., these were all grievous sins. They were just as bad as having a beer or a glass of wine or coffee in that particular church. Now, to be fair, this was a cultural teaching. And uh, in the particular ward that I was in, there actually was a, a bishop that would not give people temple recommends. Uh, if, if He would ask them point blank, do you drink Mountain Dew? And, and if they said yes, they wouldn't get a temple recommend. And when the state president found out, they stepped in and had everyone redo their temple recommends without asking that question because it wasn't really the big deal that that, that culture thought that it was. So I, I do want to make sure you understand that this was not a church teaching, but a cultural understanding. But as a kid, I didn't know that. I just knew that I had learned at home and learned at church that you did not drink these particular drinks. But man, I wanted to know what Dr. Pepper was. It sounded disgusting. Why on earth would you make... I mean, I've, I've had Sprite. I've had orange grape soda. I've had root beer. Those are delicious. Why would you make a drink if orange soda tastes like orange, kind of? And grape soda tastes like kind of like grape. Why would you drink something that tastes like peppers? What kind of peppers were they? Was it like black pepper? Was it green pepper? Was it chili peppers? I, mean, I know some people like spicy things, but I don't get it. But the devil was sitting on my shoulder and wanted me to try it. And the newspapers cost a quarter a week. So a lot of people just gave me change. So I had a lot of change. And every time I had that change in my pocket, and knowing that part of it was mine, I would look and I would think, I really want to find out what this Dr. Pepper stuff is. And finally, one day, I took a quarter from my earnings and made sure no one was looking. And I went and I got myself a Dr. Pepper. And I hid behind a bush. And I, I took a, a sip of it. It was delicious. It tasted nothing like peppers. It was 
so good. And no, this is not an endorsement for Dr. Pepper. And I was like, why would they call this Dr. Pepper? This is amazing. I didn't know what it tasted like, except it just tasted good. And I sat there and I, and I, I drank some more. And I don't even think I drank a tenth of that. You know, I had some steps. And then all of a sudden, I just started crying. I dumped out the pop. And I just sat there and hid and cried. I was so afraid to walk back from behind that bush. I was so afraid I was going to get caught. I took that Dr. Pepper can and I buried it as deep into the trash can there as I could. I didn't want anybody to know what I had done. I was sad. I, I walked slowly through the rest of my route, which thankfully was almost over. When I got in the car, my mom asked me what was wrong. She could tell there was something going on. And it took me a while, but I finally confessed. I broke down and I told her exactly what I had done. And so when we got home, she made a phone call. She made an appointment for me to talk to our bishop that Sunday. And the bishop sat there very gravely with me. My mother had not told him what he did, what I had done, rather. She had not told him what I had done, but she made it clear that what I had done was going to make me not worthy of going on a temple trip. I, would, I was no longer temple worthy. So you can imagine what he thought. Just use your imagination. And whatever you're thinking, you're probably right. I don't know what he was really thinking, but I'm sure it wasn't this kid drank a Dr. Pepper. So I'm sitting there. I couldn't even look him in the face. And I finally told him what I did. And he says, you did what? I was like, I, I, drank, I drank Dr. Pepper. I didn't drink the whole thing. I just took a couple steps. I just want to know what it tasted like. I want to know why they made a pop that tasted like peppers. I want to know if it was spicy. I, I figured I'd get a Sprite to wash it down if it wasn't good. And at that point, once he realized I was being serious, he had a choice to make. Number one, he made the right choice by doing his best not to laugh at me. And when I finally was able to see him, I could tell that he was trying really hard not to laugh. You know, he, he, his choice here was, I don't want to teach this kid that he's going to hell for drinking a Dr. Pepper, right? At the same time, he was also, I don't want to usurp his mother's authority and tell him that this isn't the problem. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he basically very gently told me that, you know, um, there's gray areas in some things. And that, that he could tell I was repentant. I didn't need to worry about it. And if my mom didn't want me drinking Dr. Pepper, then I shouldn't do it. And But that, you know, I was still temple worthy and that it was going to be okay. And when we got in the car, my mom <laughs> was not very happy about the fact that I guess that I'd been forgiven. I think she thought that the bishop had gone too easy on me. But she was a part of that culture. And she's not, she wasn't being a bad mom. She wasn't an evil person. She was doing what she had been taught was right. She was worried that if someone had seen me with a can of Dr. Pepper, she said, you know, at least you were hidden. If someone would have seen you, now that puts a bad light on the whole church. Everyone's always watching us because we're Mormons. I heard that all the time growing up. Not just from my mom, from a lot of people. I tell you this story for two reasons. One, because it is a funny story. I, I hope that, that you got a laugh out of it. But the other reason is because whatever it is that we're doing, the real question we need to ask ourselves is, how did it hurt someone else? How did it hurt us? How did it hurt someone else? How did it hurt our relationship with God? Now, this did hurt my relationship with God because it made me afraid that God didn't love me anymore. And that's Satan. Remember what the scripture says that we're going over this week. God came not to condemn us, but to save us. So we know that the Lord wasn't going to put any hellfire or misery on me. All that misery came from myself. Who did I hurt? Well, I probably hurt my teeth a little bit with all that sugar. You know, gave myself some caffeine. But at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, how does what we do hurt others? This did make it so my siblings lost a little bit of confidence in me. By the time I graduated high school, our family did not have any problem at all drinking caffeinated drinks. We had realized that it wasn't actual 
theology or doctrine. It was just a cultural thing. And that's also one of the reasons why I'm against dogmatism. But what is it, whatever it is that you're suffering from, whatever it is you're condemning yourself from, ask yourself, how did it hurt someone else and how is it hurting your relationship with the Lord? Because I can guarantee you that the Lord's waiting to hear from you. God will talk to all of us. There's this myth that I was raised with that God won't talk to wicked people. I'm going to tell you that's not true. The Holy Ghost does not go to bed at midnight. God is always there for us. Wicked people won't listen. That doesn't mean that God isn't talking to them. And truly wicked people will hear God and do bad things anyway. But the way we miss the mark is very simple. When we're not loving the Lord, we're not loving our neighbors. That doesn't mean we condemn ourselves. And it doesn't mean that we condemn others. It means we love ourselves where we are and we love others where they are just as God loves us. We don't know who's truly been born again. Remember what Jesus said in 3 Nephi about the Lamanites. When they were converted, the Holy Ghost fell upon them and they knew it not. There are people that are converted and don't know it. It's one of the reasons why I'm a universalist. I believe that many people have come to Christ that don't even know who Christ truly is. I've talked to really good people who I believe are born again. They hate the idea of God because of the people that have made God look like a wicked, vengeful, terrible, terrible being. They've humanized God to a point to where God is just this nasty, controlling person. So, of course, these people who are good are not going to like something that is evil. But God isn't evil. And when they die, they'll realize they've known God the whole time. So, brothers and sisters, my message for you this week is twofold. God loves you. Don't condemn yourself. God loves everyone you come in contact with. Don't condemn them either. That's my message. And I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, Kyle. So may the Lord bless you this week. This week and uh, let's pray for all those people that are Ill, Ill like Cal, that, that Kyle, that there will be healing. That there be healing in their bodies and in their minds and in their souls. So don't forget, Wednesday, Thursday night, sorry, uh, is prayer night again and uh, you can go on to the church's website which you'll see uh, the link to on the screen above or below. I'm going to finish up with prayer now. As we come to an end of our Sabbath service, Loving Creator God, we thank you this time and that your spirit has been with us. And I ask that your spirit continue to be with us this week as we go about our things we do. As we communicate with people, let them see the Jesus in us, Lord. Let us be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world, in our community. And I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.